everybody, this is your host Yoshino, and you're listening to episode 124 with artist Jesse Draxler. And Jesse's a very good friend of mine and has been featured in multiple No Wave group exhibitions. This is actually Jesse's fifth appearance on R Secoded. You can check out his work at jessedraxler.com. We talked about a lot of books in this episode, one including Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, Under the Skin by Michelle Faber, which is a film that I really like, and another book that I've been reading called Freedom from Anger. Draxler actually gave me this book, and I've been carrying it around with me, reading a few passages out of it on a daily basis. And it really helps you to recognize and understand the subtleties and nuances of anger and how these feelings and emotions can overwhelm us and how it builds up over time. So I really enjoyed this book in particular. Jesse also introduced me to this graphic novel called Upgrade Soul by Ezra Clayton Daniels. That was a really good book. It was just such a beautifully strung together story about this elderly couple that finds this new sort of sci-fi technology that allows them to transfer their consciousness into another being. Yeah, I just found that to be a very fascinating book and it was so well written. So definitely check that out too uh, if you enjoy graphic novels. But yeah, Jesse and I started to hang out a lot more, primarily because I started teaching in boxing. You know, we were talking about doing this episode, and it's really just a solid catch-up on both of our experiences as of recently. And, and knowing Jesse for over the past six years, it's really interesting for me to see Jesse transition and move fluidly between different mediums within his artwork. He's just a really great guy, and I always have great conversations with him. Also, before I forget, it would help so much if you can go to our iTunes page and leave us a review. It helps for viewers just like yourself to hear about this podcast. Every review counts, so please do that if you can take the time out of your day to do so. Here it is, episode 124 with Jesse Draxler for Ars Decoded. asked you this but like what made you decide to move to los angeles because you moved in 2012 or 13 i think it was 2013 or 2014 maybe in between those yeah yeah because i think i'm we met in 2013 so we met before i lived here full time did we yeah i think our first meeting was at the line hotel really at the commissary i think that's what we just sat down for coffee or something i think so oh well, I did go there a lot. Like that was my that was my spot. I lived oh, on the okay. road, yeah. and I hated my apartment. So every day I'd get up, pack up my backpack, and go set up camp at the fucking Line Hotel. Yeah. Did you live in Koreatown? Yeah, kind of between um, Koreatown and Pico Union. Oh, okay. Not the greatest area, not the greatest apartment, but I was poor, and I was just moved. <laughs> yeah, it's my first apartment here. But I mean. That's not exactly 100% true because I did live here about two or three years before that. I lived here for like seven or eight months straight. Oh, okay. Um, what and were then, you doing? Well, that time, nothing. At first time, um, my art career was nothing. So I was out here and I worked at this fusion Vietnamese Mexican restaurant mm. on uh, right on Sunset, kind of oh, across okay. from the Echo on Sunset. Oh, I worked wow. at the, yeah, this like Bon Mi Fa Place. But yeah, obviously I wasn't doing anything because I moved back. Okay, so then you moved back to Minnesota. Okay, so why did you, why'd you end up doing that? Why'd I end up moving back to Minnesota? Yeah. I mean, I was broke. I was just, I had no, I couldn't afford to live out here. Yeah, but, w- but what made you uh, move to Los Angeles two years prior to 2013? Just because, like, I don't know. Yeah, just I to had see a, what I had like. an apartment that I could live at at the time and... I I want I always, I always wanted to move to California. I mean, I think a lot of Midwesterners have that, you know, like California dream type thing. But um, I did for a long time, like since I was pretty young. I always wanted to move to the ocean, California. Yeah, all that shit. I was I like palm trees and all that 
everything that wasn't Minnesota or Wisconsin or the Midwest I liked. And I just wanted to come out here. And so I had the opportunity. I don't know. I was just a shithead kid, really. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't care. I was like, fuck it all. Yeah. I just drove out here, actually. I drove all the way and then yeah. drove all the way back. But you have a, ca- a cabin, right, out in Minnesota? Now I do. I mean, that that's new. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, well, it's really small, but yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you, when you head back over there, do you have like a, do you find kind of solitude and, um, in the isolation of being out there and being able to like be in your own thoughts and, and whatnot? Yeah. I love it. My dad owns a bunch of land up there, uh, in all near each other, um, some further away, but all pretty near each other. But, um, my, my cabin's only, it's eight foot by 12 feet kind of almost like 10 by 10 so it's super tiny that's awesome and it's a little ways away from my dad's cabin Mm. and so i'm not completely isolated alone you know he'll be out there and we'll cook dinners and shit like that but yeah i love it i love uh being up there and being away and the isolation yeah being in the woods is it kind of like a tiny home yeah it's a tiny home it's definitely a tiny home i mean besides the fact that my small cabin it doesn't have plumbing it's just basically a big room, floor to ceiling windows almost in the front, um, like a fold down desk, a couple of shelves. I have a bed in there mm. uh, and a wood uh, stove for heat in the winter. Mm. Um, but that's it. Uh, there's lights that are charged by batteries that are solar powered batteries or like solar charged batteries. And yeah, it's super chill. Yeah. What do you do out there? Well, it's kind of newer and... I've only been able to use it, I think, twice now, actually. It's been only two times. The first time I went and I had, like, this this grand idea of that I was going to work out there and I brought, like, a project with me to collage and all this shit. And um, I kind of regret doing that because it, it it didn't really flow for me when I was out there in the same way or whatever. I, I shouldn't have been trying or forcing, like, work. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, I should have just been out there and kind of experiencing whatever... But I was out there for three weeks um, and I was trying to work. But then I was out there more recently, earlier this year, and I didn't bring anything with me. Uh, and that was kind of the point of just like, mm-hmm. so I read a ton. That's mostly what I did when I was out and like, when I would be alone, I would read and I would uh, just like, you know, meditate for lack of better word, yeah. but, uh, but just kind of like be there, mm-hmm. uh, feel it. Other than that, I was just kind of helping my dad do land stuff. Like we cut down a tree that was dead in one of his properties and drug it out with a tractor and uh, just that kind of shit. Yeah. Um, gardening, cooking a lot of food from the garden, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, on one of the properties, we're going to build like a full size studio that I can live, work in, all of it, you know, three stories, the works, so full oh, wow. on place. So like designing that and going through that whole process, getting the land ready to build on because it's raw land, Mm -hmm. um, all those things is just really fun to both do and to figure out together and talk about. Do you think that you will move out there full time eventually? I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't matter, honestly, uh, right now. If I think about it, I get a little stressed out where I'm just like, because I don't want to be isolated in Wisconsin and it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin. There's not a lot around. Like you'd have to drive a ways to find any culture at all or anything like that. But um, like I don't want to move out there and just be isolated and alone. But at the same time, like I do want to go out there all the time and be for that exact reason. Yeah. So, I mean, ideally what it would be is just kind of like a pivot point, like a home base, you know, mm-hmm. kind of when I have a couple of months where it's like nothing's going on, I can just go there and I can yeah. stay there, live, invite people to visit and whatever, but also be able to leave. Mm-hmm. whenever i want you know For sure never want to yeah. be trapped by anything that's what scares me is that if i dump like all my money and resources into this place and then like i don't have those money and resources anymore to to move around and now mm-hmm. i'm stuck there and that's what i don't want to happen so i'm For sure taking it slow and i keep on telling my father like i don't want to be stuck you know like so we got to take it slow and be smart with the finances and how we go about this that sure. makes sense yeah. yeah yeah i think there's and I can only relate this to like my own experiences, but just even having certain possibilities in front of you gives you a sense of freedom, Mm -hmm. you know? I think having possibilities is what makes is, is that feeling of freedom, right? When you have a lot of possibilities in front of you and you're not Mm -hmm. limited in your possibilities. And it's so important to me, you know, like freedom is the number one thing 
I nice, like really strive for in my life. I think most people do, yeah. whether or not they're conscious of that. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's interesting because I think it resonates in your artwork too. Really? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, some of those pieces that I've been seeing recently from you are, they're, they're still the same voice. I can tell it's your voice, but it's different in, in, a, in approach. Yeah. The freedom part comes from like just not being limited in your vision or in your processes. Yeah. Or you're not trying to repeat something that was successful before. Yeah, that's death. Is it Picasso that has that line? Like success is dangerous because you become successful. You start to copy yourself. And when you start to copy yourself, you're dead. I, that's not the quote, but it's basically yeah. it equates to that. For that's, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel that all the time. Well, there's a couple of things that I've been thinking about in terms of success. Like I think to truly be successful, it should be, it's almost like an afterthought. Like it should just happen. It's a, it yeah, shouldn't it should be. Just it shouldn't happen. be the goal starting out. It yeah, should be it a byproduct of your practice or whatever you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think like you know, as a younger adult, I was trying to figure out oh, like how can I be successful, mm-hmm. and I think that was partially just because I was young and just had different um, values, I mm-hmm. guess. But also, but you hear that a lot. I mean, Basquiat famously always yeah. said that he wanted to be famous like he just straight up mm. so and you hear that you've heard that from other artists too like big famous artists that they started yeah. out saying i want to be famous so then i guess that brings up certain questions about the ego too because the ego is a driving force but it could also be something that inundates you from finding success in different areas you know yeah i think when you're younger too that wanting to be famous or wanting that or whatever is like uh, a way of saying just that you want to be able to like survive off of your career or something too. I knew for me back um, when I was younger, early twenties or whatever, I equated being known with just like, Oh, if I'm known, like that must mean that I'm doing okay. And I'm no longer having to work at some shitty job and I'm making a living off of my artwork. So that's, and that's always been more what I wanted. I just wanted to be able to, sustain myself and be left the fuck alone and not have to like be under the, anybody else's thumb type thing you know so if it took fame to do it then it was like yeah fuck it i don't care i'll like let's do that then like yeah. whatever it takes yeah but, yeah but what do you think your approach is now sustaining <laughs> i don't i don't know um just going with it i don't know um i get gigs here and there i go with the flow i go with like whatever seems to be working at the time you know um I think that I've been disillusioned to a lot of the things that I used to think, you know, uh, a lot of things that I thought were success and then things that I thought would happen if you're successful. Also, same with like monetary stuff, like thinking like, oh, if I could only make this amount of money, then I'd be chill. Like if I could have this much money in my bank account, I could relax or whatever, you know, and then you start realizing like that's not the case, you know, like does it those things it doesn't matter as much as you thought it might. Um, And then you have to like reevaluate your values and be like, okay, so all the things that I thought would have helped me be relaxed and calm and find like some sense of peace. Like they didn't do that. And now I'm so I, so I accomplished all these goals that I thought were going to make me feel a certain way. And then they don't make me feel that way. And then it's a restart type situation where you have to go back to the drawing board, reevaluate your motives and your values and, and that's kind of where I am now still, you yeah. know, I still feel like I'm constantly doing that and being like, okay, so hit all those markers that I wanted to. And i still feel like the same person. I still feel like I have this inner turmoil or whatever else. And like, okay, now what can I do? Or even like when you become disillusioned with certain things that you've held on to for a long time and you've been working towards or working within this mode of thought and then all of a sudden become disillusioned with it in a lot of ways that is kind of like a, an ego dissolution or something like, mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah. and that can be a really scary thing. Like that can be super scary. Cause you're just like, Oh shit, everything I thought I knew, I don't know. I don't actually know any of that stuff. It's a freeing feeling to understand that you don't know. Yeah. But then I feel like comes this like rebuilding because I'm really hard on myself. Like when it comes to almost anything, but if I get like, once I start pulling on that thread, it can be hard on myself to the point that it's damaging. 
So when I become disillusioned with something or I thought I knew something, I'm working towards something for so long. And then all of a sudden realizing after years, like, oh, or not even years after your entire life and realizing, oh, that was just like a delusion that I had. And, um, and then you can really beat yourself up about something like that too. Or it's like, I've been, I'm wrong about that. I was wrong about that. What else am I wrong about? Oh, I'm wrong about everything. And then you're like, shit, I'm wrong about everything. I must suck. I must be stupid. Like I must've done all these things wrong. Like every, you know, and then you can be so hard on yourself. Like I was so hard on myself, even just recently that you have like a crisis of confidence where you're just completely lost. You're like, I'm not, Apparently, I suck at everything. I've mm-hmm. fucked up my entire life. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just realizing it now. And it can be a dangerous thing. It can be damaging to that, yeah. that effect. Yeah. yeah. In a lot of different ways. You know, something that I've been thinking about is just the idea of constant forgiveness, whether it be for other people that have wronged you or whether it be for yourself, for things that you fucked up on. Mm-hmm. It's bound to happen, man. I mean, even yeah. if. I mean, some people more than others, though. I feel like. I feel like I woke up from like a long sleep one day realizing like, oh shit, like every single thing I've been doing is bad or like I've done bad things and like you get, um, you feel like you've done bad things, but then you also were going down the wrong path or whatever because you were disillusioned with these ideas that don't hold up or whatever. And you realize like you start questioning if you're a good person and shit like that too. Um, I was also raised Catholic. Uh, I never like, participated in the faith like from my own volition uh i was forced to for a while but as soon as i didn't have to i didn't anymore Mm -hmm. but that was ingrained in me guilt was ingrained in me or whatever so like i'll feel guilt to like crazy degrees where it's like i don't know like a couple summers ago i had to like volunteer at places just to like appease like how shitty i felt about myself and stuff Mm. um but yeah, I mean, yes, self-forgiveness is super loving, self-loving kindness and all that shit like Pema Chodron talks about. And um, hmm, I actually just picked up a Pema Chodron. Really? Yeah, book. she's awesome because uh, she's so gentle. So like when I like reading her when I'm really full of self-hate and like yeah. really hard on myself, I read her yeah. because she's so uh, gentle and kind and like her whole thing is loving kindness, you know, that self-loving mm-hmm. kindness thing. So um, she's great to read when feeling like that but yeah. for self-forgiveness it's easier said than done that's for sure yeah. like you can talk about all day but i mean for some reason like i'll haunt myself and just i can forgive other people i can forgive other people's hang-ups and feeling like people wronged me and stuff like i get hung up on it but i can forgive people easier than i can forgive myself you know mm. most people are probably like that well it's probably because of this idea of control and responsibility like you feel that because you are you, you have these choices to make and you, I mean, sometimes I think it's about just releasing control. Yeah. I think I, I think I get what you're saying. The control and responsibility thing where when it's you, you see all the different ways that you could have been better. Uh, forgiving other people is way easier because you're like, Oh, I can't control them. And then you also don't have like their spider web of possibilities and thoughts. It's just like you're dealing with this one thing that they did and you can be like, yeah, that's fine, whatever. It's really easy to just be like, it happened, whatever. But when it's you, you think of like all the uh, peripheral things of things you could have done better, you know, whatever. Yeah, and plus with other people, you have distance from that. Yeah. And distance from them, both in the physical space and in the mental space. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, you don't get any mental distance from yourself. <laughs> yeah, you're constantly, you yeah. can constantly batter yourself. You know, that's why um, even bringing up uh, the Tim, that Timothy Galloway book. The Inner Game of Tennis. The Inner Game of Tennis. Yeah, yeah it's like the, uh, what, what does he call it? The first self and the second self or something oh, sure. like that? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. You got to look ahead is kind of what you're saying. Kind of, You can't just, because when you're beating yourself up or you're yep. feeling all that guilt and shit, you're, it's all the yep. past. It's all things that you've done already. You're not doing them right now, but things that you've done, you feel guilty for. Yeah. But if you just look forward and have the freedom of choice and... Yeah. Yeah. You, you actually got me back into reading. Just recently? Yeah. Just recently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, reading physical books, because a lot of the time I'm taking things... Um, through, you know, taking in things through audio, like whether it's podcasts or like audio books, um, just because you can, for me, at least I can passively listen, but sitting down and reading a physical book is really good too, because you, you control 
the pace and you can go back and read, oh wait, what did that sentence say? And then you read every single word with intent on mm-hmm. that sentence and be and let it sit in. Sometimes with audiobooks it just it's kind of passing by you and you either hear it then or you don't. It's kind of like when you have a conversation, right? And something that someone says to you really resonates with you. But with a book, you can find that sentence and then reread it a couple times. Which I like. I like being on Yeah. Book. I like physical books for sure. Yeah. And, and you got me into graphic novels. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Did you, did you read Ice Cream Man? I did read Ice Cream Man. Nice. I liked Ice Cream Man. Yeah, sweet. It's, yeah. it's good. It's, it's twisted. Yeah. Well, Upgrade Soul was... Upgrade Soul. That's what's up. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And I, I recently purchased, but I haven't read it yet, is a Black Hole. Oh, right on. Cool. Yeah. I have not read that either. Yeah. You'll have to let me know if you like that or not. Mm-hmm. I know that it got a lot of acclaim, right? People love that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think Time Magazine said it was... Yeah. I don't know. The, one of the best one or of the best. one of the most influential graphic novels type thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's rad. But Upgrade Soul is definitely... That's even just outside the category of graphic novels. That's one of the better just stories I've read in a while. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really good. Yeah. So I'm curious about your journey with boxing. <laughs> well, you, you know about everything that? about that. Sure. Yeah, we can talk about boxing. From your perspective, what, what have you been learning from <laughs> the, 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 the training? <laughs> what am I learning? Was that the question? Yeah, what have you been learning? For me, more than anything, it's been more getting to know my body and uh, just communicating with my body in a way, I guess. Yeah. Like, Boxing is cool and everything. I've never been like a person who watches boxing. I've never been a huge boxing fan or anything like that. But boxing was more of just a way of uh, getting exercise and also learning at the same time. And it's like a skill in a way. It could be useful at some point to know how to punch somebody if you needed to. Yeah. But um, overall, it's not about the boxing for me. I mean, it is because I learn it and I want to be good at it. But it's more about the practice. You know, it's more about having a practice than it is about specifically boxing. So that's yeah. what, and it's been huge for me because, um, you know, I started training with you and then I started just doing it on my own when you weren't around and jumping rope. And then I started running and I had never ran before. And that was a huge game changer where it just helped my mental state and, feel good physically you know i'm definitely even though i'm somewhat injured right now i'm definitely in the best shape i've ever been in in my whole fucking life that's awesome you know so i mean even my diet is has changed where uh i talked about this with a friend too who was who was saying it he's like you start treating your body more like a machine you're like what do i need to put in this thing to get the best output from it yeah yeah before boxing i I played basketball, obviously. It's not like I was just sitting around not doing anything. I bike. Like, that's my main form of transportation because I don't have a car. So I'm a bike commuter on a bicycle. Um, Play basketball. I like to hike. I walk a lot. So I've been active. But this was boxing was definitely a a step up Mm. in the whole whole thing. Yeah. And you've never had an injury in in basketball? No. I've sprained things. Like, minor injuries. Yeah, minor injuries, but never anything intense. That's pretty incredible man yeah i mean yeah. it's just incredible in general for me that i haven't broken something or because i've done a lot of foolish things too like skateboarding or riding bmx when i was younger mm-hmm. i've gotten like injuries but they were never of the like muscle or bone variety it was always like surface wounds i guess you'd call them but like deep gashes and stitches and shit like that yeah but no nothing crazy with like the extension of anything or breaking of anything yeah lucky yeah Yeah. So I guess like what have been some sort of thoughts that you've been having or like books that you've been reading that have like provoked thought or, um, kind of in between books right now, I've been reading a lot of short stories, like books of short stories. I like really weird fiction stuff. Uh, this book by Karen Tidbeck, some really fantastical weird fiction of just, that's the kind of shit I like. It's hard to talk about because it's like, uh, it's, it's stories that, you have to suspend like all everything you know, Mm -hmm. you know, to be in this other reality where it's just really turns everything upside down on you type shit. It's experiential as well. Yeah, totally. And I think that, uh, I like that kind of shit because it's like exercising your imagination, you know, it helps with the artwork a lot. 
like I find like the mm-hmm. reading that kind of really far out shit that's just kind of like on this completely other tip where they're suspending everything that you think you know. What's um, it called? Karen Tidback. Uh, actually, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce the name of the book. It's like Jagernath or Jagernath. Hmm. I really liked it. Um, Is it a graphic novel? No, but just a book of short stories. Hmm. Um, before that, the the last book I read that I really liked, uh, the full thing was um, Under the Skin, the novel that came before the movie. Hmm. I was what really do you like good. more, the um, movie or the novel? The they're like different things. Like I like them both because it's like the book is. It's like the movie took one aspect of the book and really zoomed in on it mm. and gave you this really vague impressionistic version of one aspect of the book, and then the book is like this whole. It gives you a whole lot more story and narrative around the events wow. that take place in the movie. So they're both great for different reasons, but huh. I really became um attached to that book that's actually the last book i read when i was at my cabin i read that whole book and um i was really in that world it was one of those books that ended and i was like oh shit i'm gonna miss this i'm gonna miss you know yeah. that world yeah. these characters i read um dark matter by blake crouch recently too oh, okay. sci-fi have you heard of that i have heard of it but it's a I very popular read one it. it reads like it's a popular one too it reads like a blockbuster movie like a blockbuster sci-fi movie yeah but it, that's fun about it too you know mm. do you ever revisit some books and not usually films? fiction short stories sometimes like fictional short stories there was a there was a short story in that jagernath that i returned to a couple of times because it was so good and it was like a short story you can just read through real quick one sitting but i i don't reread books a whole lot because i'm always want the new i always want more i always want new and more and rereading is like but i know i should patience in general is something that i'm getting better at mm. you know? would you consider yourself a patient person or an impatient person it depends on what the it's uh what what the what the object of the patience is or i don't yeah. know how you would say that but like i can be really patient with people i can be really patient when like I'm waiting at the airport. I'm not like the person who's like, I'm not fidgety and shit like that. So in that regard, I'm patient. Like I'm not a, I used to be maybe a fidgety person, but now I notice like somebody who's when they're sitting there and they're like tapping their foot constantly or moving them. Just like, that's like, you know, I almost feel sad for them or feel bad for them. Cause I know like that they're so impatient or you're antsy or whatever. Yeah. I'm not impatient like that, but I am impatient in a lot of other ways. That's for sure. Hmm. Like I want things now. Do you think that book, Freedom from Anger, that you let me borrow helps you with that? With anger? Well, or patience? Also, mm-hmm. I mean, being impatient can be a form of yeah, anger. Yeah, yeah. You, you, obviously, you read the book because... Uh, the <laughs> I, read, I, think, dude, I think I read almost every book that yeah. you've given me so far. Yeah. Well, in that Freedom from Anger book, they have that whole section where they break down in, through that lens. Uh, what is the lens of that book? It's Buddhism, right? That dude's a Buddhist yeah. monk. Yeah, uh-huh. So through the Buddhist lens, they break down what all the forms of anger are. You know that part? There's like a whole Mm -hmm. page of them and the definition of them. And you realize that like so many of the emotions that you call all these other things are predicated on anger, basically. And you break them down. So like impatience, yeah, could be called a form of anger. Um, The one that I really liked that I never really thought of as a form of anger is boredom, which is basically impatience. But boredom is a form of anger, Mm. according to buddhist philosophy i guess so i think that that book helped me a lot in like recognizing the things that are predicated on anger rather than just being like oh i'm just bored now it's like being bored is dangerous like i don't you know yeah you you avoid some of those or like or you don't give them a pass a Mm -hmm. lot just like how that book has part where it's just basically says like it's never okay to be angry you should do everything in your power anytime you feel angry to get over it or to get through it. Yeah, definitely. Like you should never, like anger is never justified. Yeah, you know? don't even, don't even entertain those thoughts of yeah. anger. You know, but something- you get, you see so much of that. You see so much of people saying that their anger is, what's the word? Not, not justified. I mean, people think that anger is justified a lot. Righteous anger. You hear that term a lot, like mm. righteous anger. That. Really? No. I feel like I hear it a lot. Like Associated to what? Don't you think a lot in like the world today and like um, like this like culture of recreational outrage? Uh, I'm not saying that's what I'm talking about exactly, but the culture is is 
right now geared towards almost yeah get angry like you should be pissed off about this like oh Oh, you're being treated unfairly fucking you know fight be angry be pissed you know scream shout and fight all that shit um well it's spectacle i think people are i mean it's pretty clear with um i mean you look at the news and it's always negative things yeah maybe five percent of it is a positive thing but, people, but don't you think that there's like an error out there of like justified anger where it's like, oh, yeah, you should be, you should be. Ang- oh, you're not angry about that. You should be. Oh, like, for sure. Yeah. But that's fucked I mean, up, man. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. No, know. no, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's just a lot of people and I'm guilty of this, too. You know, I get angry about things and um, don't have peace within the, within themselves, because if you have peace within yourself, then you don't really have to get angry. I mean, there was even within that book, uh, there was a story about a Buddhist monk that was just walking down a pathway and some random stranger came up to him and like, and pushed him. And the Buddhist monk just kept on walking. And the guy that pushed him was wondering why he wasn't getting angry. And then he approached the Buddhist monk and was asking, oh, you know, like what, like, why aren't you pissed off at me and he said oh i didn't even realize that what are you talking about yeah, i, I remember you, that i didn't yeah. realize you pushed me yeah. <laughs> so there's so many things that can provoke anger from, i mean from you you know yeah but you, for sure. but you at the end of the day allow it to allow it to well yeah that i mean that's a big thing is like uh things will happen to you that you don't have control over, but what you have control over is how you react to everything. In yeah. any situation, you have complete control over how you will react to that. And it definitely resonates with me. And all this being said, I still have like get angry. I have, I have anger problems. I think most people do, but then they don't even realize it or whatever. So I think yeah. knowing it is a big part of the battle with anger. It was like knowing like that you get set off and that you have... I'm also OCD. Like I haven't been diagnosed because I don't, I, I've saw a therapist for a long time, but it wasn't the kind of therapist that diagnoses you with shit. It's more like the sounding board therapist, but um, I'm self-diagnosed OCD. It's mm. pretty evident. So like certain things like anger, if I start getting angry and now it's kind of thoughts get in my mind, uh, I have the, that, that obsessive, thought pattern and like if it's an angry one it, man it's it's self-devouring it's yeah. you know i'll be in hell like that's what hell is to me or I, you know mm. that's real yeah. hell like just being being in hell is thinking angry things being angry and not being able to get yourself out of it yeah. you know that's fucking hell yeah i and it's and it's interesting how you know we put this perspective of hell and we associate hell and heaven to like a monotheistic religions right but really, I mean, there's so much suffering going on. I mean, you look outside, you know, there's Skid Row down the street and, and downtown, and you see so much mm. suffering going on. And these people are literally in their own hell, you know? And we also, like, put it on ourselves. Like, well, you we, know, create you know, we create our own, our own heavens and hells. But, uh, you know, I'm, I fully believe that what religion and philosophy, or it's religion that talks about heaven and hell, right? And, yeah. Um, I'm pretty, uh, you know, I'm pretty convinced that that's all just metaphor in that. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously that's, it's all metaphor in that heaven and hell are on earth. Like they're in our minds, mm-hmm. like, and we choose to be in them or not in them or whatever, yeah. you know? Um, And that's what they were talking about mm-hmm. in all, in like, you know, holy books and all that shit. That, For that's sure. That's really just about, I uh, just, uh, I would, I was reading, um, pieces every step i was reading that and he had that almost exact quote about uh you know the materials that make up hell are like anger and something else you know like these are the materials that make hell Mm -hmm. and like so when you're feeling these things you're in hell and he doesn't mean it you know uh he doesn't mean that metaphorically he means that literally you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah that's kind of where i am too where it's like I'm not worried about dying and going to a place that's going to be terrible. Um, I feel like I enter and exit hell every day, multiple times. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. I'm in and out of hell all the time. Yeah. It, it, I'm not waiting for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think, it, you know, it's all, it's also just a reaction of, 
a general population's train of thought, you know, like logical reasoning and logical thinking take much more precedent in our society than creative thinking. Mm -hmm. And so if you take like something from the Bible, for instance, like maybe you and I can see it for a metaphor for um, temptation or, you know, like the, like um, the devil um, being a snake to deceive Adam and Eve, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and making Eve give Adam the apple, right? You know, th- those those are all like sort of metaphors that you can take things from. But at some point in time, we took things too literally. You know, people took things too literally. And now there's a whole cult of Christians and Catholics <laughs> yeah. that believe in this. Yeah, stuff, you know? yeah. And like me, you know, like and I see it also from the inside, too, because like you, like Christianity I mean, with you, with Catholicism, but me with Christianity, that was pushed on me at a very young age to be around these people, to believe. I went to Christian school a Mm -hmm. majority of my life. Yeah, same. Yeah, so. I went to Catholic school for kindergarten through eighth grade. Yeah, so when you're surrounded by that all the time, it becomes, the these secondhand values become your reality. Yeah, without you even realizing it. Yeah. Like, that's what when you're going to school at a Catholic school or a Christian school or just a religious school, and then you're going to church because of school once or twice a week, and then you go on every weekend because your parents bring you to. And, um, I mean, you're spending a lot of time in a very, um, in a certain ideology within the confines of it. Right. And if you're young and you don't see a whole lot of outside of it, you just think that's what life is. That's how everywhere, everything is like that. It's like, giving kids like a pair of glasses like you're going to see out of these for the rest of your life now you know it's like a lens um that's fucked up man yeah Yeah, it was i rebelled real hard against it man as soon as i could you know like that was a huge thing that i fought against in my when i in my younger days i was yeah yeah i hated religion man i was yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think there's a certain spirit to that i mean i think you see it a lot um you know, in rebellion to those things with music. When I was growing up, I mean, this is kind of like the reason why I got into hardcore music as a kid is, is just that, which is kind of ironic too, because in San Jose, a lot of these hardcore shows, like really hardcore shows would take place at churches. Yeah, man. I feel like, which is so strange. Those early days of hardcore, right? There were a lot of, uh, church basement shows and shit like that. I don't know out here, obviously, because I didn't live out here, but, um, I was into some of the shit. I was never too into hardcore, honestly. I was into metal and shit. That was yeah. because metal was the real rebellion against the religion shit. Cause that it was all six, six, six pentagram Satan shit. And that's, yeah, that's what I was going for. Mm. Hardcore is actually like, there's a lot of, there was a lot of religious hardcore groups and, um, yeah. And they shared a lot of the same values as like Christianity, like yeah. not drinking, like the whole straight edge thing. Like, uh-huh. I couldn't get behind it. I was like, I don't know. This is just yeah. some other dark shit. Yeah. I don't think that anymore, obviously. But at the time, I was like, what? I want to rebel. Like, yeah. I don't want to just, I don't want to just scream and just be exactly like that or whatever. You yeah. Know. No, I, no, I get it. Well, I think uh, another thing about hardcore too. And I mean, now we're just kind of like putting things in categories, but, uh, a lot of it has to do with like the fashion, the aesthetic of being hardcore. And maybe me and you are talking about two different types of hardcore too. Because there is, there's like there's hardcore so many, is such a nuanced thing, and yeah. like, yeah, I was about to say, like, I am not yeah. an authority on hardcore music whatsoever. I would not want anybody listening to this to think that I know a thing like about music in general. Um, yeah, I don't know, and it yeah. hardcore is a confusing one because I'm not exactly sure what it is about music that would make it hardcore or not, but you hear things that they say like, this is hardcore. And then you hear another thing, this is hardcore too. And they do not sound alike. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Genres of music are just melding together. I mean, I'm surprised that we still hold on to really any, you know, names of things besides like, well, that's heavy. That's not, Mm -hmm. or, you know, yeah. Um, I'm, I don't know what's going on in the mainstream, honestly, because I don't pay any real attention, but it seems that like, pop country is making some sort of move where they're mixing like rap in with that or some shit. I don't know. I hear yeah. this country music being played at basketball games, like NBA games. Like I yeah. hear, and I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. How did that get mixed into the cultural zeitgeist? Yeah. How did that happen? Like, okay, I guess now, but you know, whatever. 
the most important thing is putting a positive energy out there and whatever medium you want to use to portray that I think is is perfect. We well, need more hardcore, positivity. Hardcore you know? is like predicated a lot on positivity, isn't it? Would yeah. You say? yeah. Mm-hmm. But the aesthetic of it can be seen as otherwise. Like tough guy. Tough. Could be. Yeah. yeah, it could be. I've been listening to a lot of um, like OC punk, like hardcore punk, yeah. you know, but like, like what? Like the punky hardcore. <laughs> no, <laughs> but like what bands? Um, <laughs> well, this culture abuse, they're not hardcore really at all, but they get thrown in with those yeah. hardcore bands. Uh, but that's the weird part of like hardcore because they say one of the first hardcore bands was Bad Brains, but com- Bad Brains and Hate Breed, you know, just to throw a name out there of a hardcore band. To me, mm-hmm. Hate Breed is kind of a quintessential hardcore band, right? When yeah. You, would you say? For sure, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think this says a lot about me as a, as a younger person is being more attracted to things that were aesthetic and not... When you were younger? When I was younger and going into like the beginning parts of when I was first starting photography. And it's not that antiquated. I mean, you know, it's like a slow process at realizing certain things. But now I'm just understanding more of like what it means to me, you know, as opposed to what it means to other people. So it that frames my perspective. When you say aesthetic, do you kind of just mean like surface value? Surface value. Yeah. I think we had a conversation about that when we were about to box a couple of weeks ago about um, just your perspective on design. Well, yeah. um, I have a background in illustration and like that's a huge part of illustration is you want it to look. It's got to be eye catching. It's just it's one of the fundamental bases of illustration. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you get into places or for me, at least when I get into places where it looking good isn't part of the, you know, it's not necessary or it doesn't need to. Like, I get like, what? I don't know how to do it. I really don't know how to do it. Like, I don't know how to make a thing that's not aesthetically pleasing. Mm-hmm. Even if I do, it still is aesthetically pleasing. Like, there's just something about anything that I produce, even if it's grotesque, it's still like <laughs> aesthetically pleasing. Mm-hmm. I don't, it's like impossible for me not to, or, or for, for it not to, which is weird. And I realize it about myself. And sometimes I hate it about myself because I want to make like random, crazy, whatever. But anytime I do, it doesn't feel right. And it doesn't feel like me. Everything almost looks too polished that I do or something. Or at times, like when I'm beating up on myself or when I'm being hard on myself, that's when I'll always go to like, oh, my shit looks too polished. Right? It all looks too nice. It's all, it all looks too pleasing. It all looks too... yeah. Um, I want things to look more authentic or something or more, I don't know. But I think it is authentic because just from me knowing you, it seems that you're constantly reevaluating and you have like an honest approach. Yeah. I guess I, when it really gets bad is when I, you know, and this is, this is hell right here. This is a form of hell is when mm-hmm. you're comparing yourself to other artists in particular, I won't even say could just in general comparing yourself because comparison in general is fucking stupid. Yeah. Um, but when you're like specifically to talk about it with an art, uh, that's hell, man. When you're comparing your work to other people's work and then you want your work to be more whatever, you know, want it to feel more like something else or what. And you're, to me, that's just real. That's a real form of hell. But I'll do that. That's what will happen where it's like, yeah oh man, like if only I could do work that was more like this, you know, or like these, you go see work at a gallery and I mean, it's not aesthetically pleasing at all, but for some reason it really emotes and it really is like hitting, scratching an itch for you or something. And then I just will beat up on myself for a long time after that. Be like, oh, I can't do that. I can't, oh, you know, that like I wish this or that was more like this or that. And yeah, then it's really bad. Mm Mm-hmm that's when it becomes a real issue where it's like, I can't even, I can't even get myself to like (laughs) produce shit like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And I I think that just speaks a lot to just humanistic perspectives. I mean, you'll even see it with athleticism, you know, you only have a certain uh, um, amount of capabilities, Mm -hmm. you know, like for instance, like with boxing, it's like, there's, 
thousands of people that can throw like right hands a certain way, but you can only throw it this way. So it's like, how do you use your tool sets mm -hmm. for your advantages? Right. And that can be with, within anything. So it's like, sometimes you can't get away from the way that you do things. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Reminds me of something I heard on a podcast recently. Somebody just saying, uh, they were talking about working out and they weren't a particularly athletic person or anything like that, but they were like saying, um, I'm never going to be, you know, the best at any of these things. Or uh, I think that they probably trained in boxing as well or something like that. And they're like, I'm never going to be the best boxer. He's like, but I can be the best version of me as a boxer. I can be, or, you know, um, I'm never going to be the most attractive fit person, but I can be the most attractive fit version that of, of me as I can be, you know? So it's like just comparing yourself to yourself or versions of yourself rather than comparing yourself to other people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, you should be doing the same with art. Right. Obviously. Mm -hmm. um, easier said than done. Yeah. 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 I, th I think I was recently listening to a, a Rogan podcast. I think it was with Frost Sahabi. He Frost Sahabi is a uh, trainer and he is the head coach of uh, TriStar Gym in Quebec, I think. Okay. And he trains George St. Pierre, who's like a really, really big MMA fighter. Okay. Joe was saying like, oh, like I'm a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but then there's black belts like insert such and such world champion and, you know, and it's almost like he's a white belt. Uh -huh. Like a good approach and a good train of thought is to just constantly compare yourself to yourself, but also forgive yourself for not reaching a certain expectation or something like that that you had in the past yeah yeah right yeah no yeah. yeah expectations are dangerous too yeah for me expectations in art are a form of death uh, too like where it's like it's, it's a form of death before even starting if i start out and i have an expectation and i guarantee you i've said this in a podcast before maybe, <laughs> like one of a, but just, just, but say it, I, just say it well if i have an expectation going into yeah. working on something that's just setting myself up for the worst, um, the worst studio time possible if I go into something and have an expectation. Because when you have an expectation, you're kind of limiting yourself uh, to like everything outside of that expectation where it's like, and I mean, I'm kind of being hypocritical because I talk about limitations as a good thing too a lot, um, but not that kind of limitation where it's an expectation is like you're going into this and you want it to turn out to look like something else or look like what you have in your head. Yeah. You're expecting you're, it to be yeah, a successful and, um, piece. But the best way that I work is kind of when I sit down and I don't have an expectation really. It's just like, I'm going to work with this material. Uh, I kind of know kind of, but overall it's like, we'll just see what happens. Those are when I work the best. Like this morning I, um, I finger painted cause I have a, I'm working on an illustration gig right now and uh, it involved doing some painting and I was finger painting this morning, but I woke up and I just, I didn't know what I was really going to do, but I just sat down with the materials and I ended up like just crushing it this morning. It was one of the best like studio times I've had in a little while, but I had no idea what I was going to do. But then there'll be other times when I'll sit down and I'll have like, okay, I, it has to, like, I have to do this thing. It has to look like this or I'm trying it to look like this. I want it trying basically just yeah. trying it all. Um, and it will just be the worst session, you know, because everything I make won't be, what I what I'm expecting it to be mm -hmm. and then you're also just um I'll just like toss it aside not realizing that oh maybe what I did do though was rad maybe that you know even though it's not the expectation it could have been the coolest thing I ever did but just because I have this expectation it's like having blinders on yeah you know what I mean mm -hmm. like you're not open to those possibilities of other things you know? yeah yeah you can kind of get lost in it I think yeah, you you just you get lost in it and you mm -hmm. uh you uh, miss out on a lot of things I think, you know. Mm -hmm. And expectations kind of like having like one goal and that's the only thing that you will um you'll only settle for this one thing, you know, even if a whole bunch of other great shit happens, you're like, "Nope, it has to be this." That's not a good way of going about it. I mean, my process in general is all about like just trying to, you know, you throw a little, you know, throwing shit around and then something resonates with you. You hear a little click in your brain and all of a sudden you start pulling on those threads. 
but that first step for my process at least when i on good days or how i prefer it to be mm-hmm. is to just be pretty random and not have any direction and just let myself you know do a bunch of shit and then when something starts to be interesting then you just pull on that thread and go yeah. down that path but you don't know what that path is going to be when you start out you know you don't know what it's what you're exactly going to be going for so when do you think you create your best work in the mornings in the afternoon at night it's tough um i don't think there's a specific time of day i mean i try to i try to work at all those times of day you know like i i basically have two days in a day i wake up super early and some days i'll try to read for a little bit but otherwise i just go straight to work like and that's at like 5 30 in the morning and uh I'll work until I'm like burnt out or I smoke too much pot that I can't <laughs> think anymore. And, uh, and then I'll take a break. And in the middle of the day, like I'll usually like cook lunch and shit like that. Yeah. Cook lunch, read a little bit, maybe watch a show if there's something I wanted to watch. Yeah. Um, and then like kind of do like a meditation type, just like kind of do it, try to wipe my brain basically. Yeah. Uh, fall asleep a little bit if I want to or feel like it or just happen to. And then I'll get up again. And have like a whole second day where it's like, so I feel like I make my best work, I guess, shortly after waking up with that fresh brain, you know? Yeah. Um, so the time of day is somewhat irrelevant, but it's usually right after I wake yeah. up is when I'm feeling best. So I started doing this thing with journaling in the morning and just giving myself the ability just to immediately wake up, start going pen and paper. And I specifically do pen and paper because there's that tactileness, mm-hmm. right? There's that tactile quality, but allowing it to be like a stream of consciousness. Mm-hmm. So I don't judge it. Whatever I have to say, I put on there. And because I'm just waking up, I don't really get self-conscious about it, you know? But I think where I'm trying to go with that is, is I feel like all of your creative energy is already within you and it's becoming realized by creating things. You mean like all of the creative energy that you'll ever have is already inside of you and it just comes out slowly over the course of your life? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like, and maybe this is just my ego talking, but I know that I have certain things to contribute that just haven't happened yet. I have have that sense too where... I don't know if I'm fully understanding where you're like the, the, the idea of that all your creative energy is already inside of you type thing or if this plays off of that or not but i feel like creative energy flows through me Mm, like you're a vessel for creative energy or a conduit more than a vessel Mm. like on my best days are the days where i feel like how would i do that i don't know that you know i don't know what i'm i have you know you just feel completely out of control but this crazy shit's happening you know this beautiful stuff's unfolding in front of your face and you don't really completely understand that's what i feel mostly i feel and then so to bring it all together or whatever, I think that might be why I do my best work shortly after waking up is because all of the, all of that other shit, all of them, the stresses of a day of just life, uh, you get text messages from people that you're, uh, make you feel one way or another, all the judgment, like we were talking about your expectations and you think too much and all that fogs up. So like, Okay, this is probably getting like a little too much, but um, to use the analogy of being a conduit or whatever, you could almost just say like if you're a window and that things shine through the glass of you and over the course of the day, all these things that you take in or whatever fog up the glass and then every time you sleep, it like wipes the glass clean again and now that information or that creative energy can come through easier uh, because it's not clouded, but then the day goes on again or like the time period goes on again after waking up and it becomes cloudier and cloudier and cloudier. I think there's something to that where it's like, if I'm a conduit for that creative energy, I become clogged up and I need to be cleared back out for that to be able to flow through me properly again. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, to add on to that, I think that true peace comes from being able to lessen that fogginess. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that analogy is actually from like a, uh, who, who talks about that? Yeah. It's becoming clear here. Um, there's somebody who uses that analogy of, I think it's a foggy mirror though, actually that they talk about. Is it the guy who wrote the four agreements? 
the five levels of attachment. <laughs> I was just I was just uh, listening to that. I can't remember again. if it's him or not, but I'm somebody not sure. talks about the foggy mirror and like. Uh, it might be Don Miguel Ruiz. Yeah, yeah. The four agreements. So it's a similar analogy. It's different because I'm talking about like something flowing through or whatever. Um, and he's talking about like seeing your true self type thing. That, that mirror, like you're looking in a mirror, but the mirror is foggy and you kind of see yeah. like a, a hazy reflection of yourself and you got to, and like doing all the, the work on yourself or whatever is just yeah. trying to clean that mirror off, you know, yeah. to get that clear picture. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, uh, that's why it's really hard for artists or creatives or, or just people who have been opened up to like go back into like reintegrate into like this capitalistic society, like, because we realize that there are more things that are meaningful than just making money. You know, yeah. there's more value out there than just that. That's yeah. not the only areas of success. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. But I definitely see how yeah. having to make money to make a living like yeah. affects me yeah. negatively. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it affects everybody, but I mean, definitely me too. hundred um, percent all the time. Sometimes really bad. Sometimes it paralyzes me from even being able to work, you know, or you're just in this state of fear of not knowing, you know, uh, being freelance, a freelance artist uh, with no other forms of income is terrifying. Like, because if you don't have a job working at the time, you could be like, maybe I'll never get a job again. And then you start thinking, okay, so the amount of money I have right now is a finite amount that's just going to run out. And then what? So like having to make a living is definitely a detriment to an artist, right? If you want to yeah. be a full-time artist. But it's like, what do you do with that information, I guess? Yeah. And I, I've also, maybe maybe capitalism is like a an adversarial type of thing where it's something to work against that it's actually helps me because there's been so many things in my life where they're negative things that suck and um they've turned out to be good things because they make me work harder like prove people wrong that's a good one which it's a i know it's a form of anger and it's not healthy but i think no, e- even if it's not healthy it's definitely can be creatively stimulating and motivating can yeah. be a motivator you know proving mm-hmm. people wrong or yeah because I was bullied a lot growing up. And like, uh, really? Oh, yeah. Real bad. I was like the... Why? My kids are, was, kids are jerks. Yeah, man. I was different. And we were from, I was from a town of under 1,000 people when I went to school there and lived there. But at the, about the Catholic school until eighth grade. And then in high school, I was bullied both. Like I was like the number one... Well, one of the biggest, you know, losers uh, of uh, grade school. And then in high school, it gets a little bit more diverse, I guess, you know, and like. Yeah. But why do you why do you say that? Because I I got bullied. I got beat up. I got, you know, name calling. It was it was relentless, too. It was fucking intense. You know, I don't know why. Yeah. I was just different. You know, like Mm -hmm. I said, it was a small town. My. uh, Yeah, I don't really know. Maybe I sucked. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> maybe no. i deserved it <laughs> no no well no i mean i i mean i can empathize with you there that's actually what got me into doing brazilian jiu-jitsu oh yeah you were saying that yeah yeah but you know it's all it's all good lessons if you look back on it yeah i mean being bullied and shit definitely uh pushed me to an extreme of of certain certain way yeah I was, yeah. Like I rebelled against that. I wanted to prove people wrong. It definitely gave me a drive and shit like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, not that alone. There's a lot of you know shit in my childhood that gave me things to to fight against. But being bullied was definitely one of them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And but it on the same note, I mean, I'm still, you know, you still deal with the issues that you get from that or for whatever. Sure. You know, I'm super insecure about things. Like, yeah, I still have have issues with people. You know, because of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our insecurities, we can allow them to really get the better of us. Yeah. And that is another form of anger as well. Yeah. Anger yeah. against ourselves. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think most of my anger is at myself or, or like inward, mm. inward anger. Yeah. Yeah. We can't, you know, it's, it's, it's really tough to get away from your projections of, of things mm-hmm. because that's part of our lens. Yeah, exactly. It's the way we perceive things. It's our filter. It's everything. And then you don't realize that the filter's on, and then all of a sudden the filter gets pulled off one day, and you're just like, oh, fucking shit. I don't know nothing. I don't yeah. know anything. Yeah, that happens that's, to me all the time. Yeah. 
No. Yeah. I mean, all of last year or a majority of last year, I went on this psychedelic tirade. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But no, I, I, I did like, I don't know, eight mushroom trips or something like that. And uh, it really opened me up and it, I just came back to that same conclusion. Well, there's a couple of conclusions. The first one is I know nothing. Mm -hmm. And the second one is that everything is meaningless and everything is meaningful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for the same reason though, right? Yeah, or yeah. For, for each other's reason or something like everything. Mental paradox. Yeah. Everything is meaningful yeah. because everything is meaningless. It's one of those things where it's yeah. like the extremes of the thing are the same. Which is, it's like a paradox. It's one of those things where it's like, just don't think about it. Don't think about that one. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. It makes sense <laughs> if you don't think about it. Yeah, okay? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes simplicity is better. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just understanding what's out there and, and, and still going about your way. But like you said, you were reading, um, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl. Right? Yeah. Uh, in that, uh, he talks about that where it's like, you mm. have to give your life meaning because life is meaningless. But if you give it meaning, then it's meaningful. But because it's meaningless, you are able to give it meaning and therefore it's meaningful. If life was just meaningful and you were just playing along with it, you wouldn't have free will, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to give your own life its own meaning. Yeah. But people out there are always looking for the exterior meaning, right? Like through religion or whatever else. They're like those are all, all religions are basically just people wanting there to be a meaning to life, and instead of them having to, them making it, it's them just be like, someone give me one, right? Mm -hmm. It's like someone just fill fill this blank for me. Yeah, because that's daunting. Mm -hmm. Can be daunting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it can also be really liberating, even if you think sure. like. Even if you can just say, like, uh, life is meaningless uh, besides the meaning you give it. Well, if you don't give it any meaning, well, then it can be really, Bleak. you can be really lackadaisical, right? Well, yeah. You can just be like, whatever. Yeah. Nothing fucking matters. I don't even know, man. I feel like I've been going through a lot of what we were just talking about of, like, that whole, like, where you're just constantly waking up to your own delusions and realizing, like oh, I thought I knew something about this or I thought I knew this and realizing that you don't or whatever. I feel like I've been going through that a lot. I feel like I've been sleeping for a long time and I'm just waking up. But I feel like that's continuous. It just never ends, you know? I've been um, experimenting a lot in the art practice, you know? So that's mostly where my my mental play has been landing lately is just in the experimenting scene where I want to go next because... Um, well, you know, last year I released the book, um, yeah. Misophonia, and uh, that felt almost like wrapping up everything that came before it because that book uh, spanned, you know, five or so years of work. Not all of the work is in there from those years, yeah. but it spanned that amount of time. And so it was kind of like, okay, let's get all the best stuff together, make a book, and then release the book. And then I almost felt empty afterwards where it was like all that shit was kind of with me until it was put in that book, released, and I felt like I needed to move on from it. it was, and so it's been like, hmm. I mean, ever since. So that book came out June 1st, 2018. You know, June 1st, 2019 just happened, so it's a year. So I've been reflecting on that a lot and realizing really, like, ever since it's been just, like, searching, you know, like, searching for for what I do but doing it differently or how do I do what I do differently or how do hmm. I explore things that i haven't explored already and and shit like that so yeah. it's a lot of experimenting and a lot of just like going out there and trying to be inspired by things that i wasn't inspired by before mm -hmm. or purposefully looking into things that i didn't like before but and that's to say it lightly even where it's like not i didn't just not like them it's like i really thought i i really didn't like them and i thought i had a reason for not liking it and i just thought it wasn't my thing and then just making myself be like, no, what's that about? Let me, let me read that book that I didn't or like read that graphic novel where I didn't think that style was like I was into. Or I mean, even, even culturally, just reading stuff from other cultures or like trying to read about other people's perspectives, people that are very different from me, yeah. read their stuff and see what that perspective's like. So there's been a lot of that, you know, recently, um, and for the past while, I guess, yeah. of just like trying to get out there and see what resonates with me and shit like that. And then, I mean, I guess 
I guess we should talk about like, um, whether well, is that opening this weekend at No Gallery? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk um, about that? Yeah. It's well, uh, well, No Gallery was started by uh, someone who's been acting as my studio manager, Casey, for the last while. He used to be the director at Booth Gallery. You're familiar with him? Yeah. We've had Casey Gleghorn on the podcast That's as well. That's right. Yes, you have had him on the podcast. So he moved out here just earlier this year and already is remodeled this whole space. He gutted a whole space and open, uh, opening it up this weekend. It's called No Gallery. It's on La Brea in Los Angeles. That's been awesome to watch him in that whole process, uh, which has been a lot. He's put a lot into it. It's a beautiful space. It looks gorgeous. He's been doing studio visits with all kinds of, you know, every artist that he can. He's just been hustling hard and that finally opens up. So it's cool to to see that come to fruition in a way or whatever. Yeah. But me and him have worked closely for a long time, uh, stuck with each other through some shit. Uh, and it's all coming to a fruition uh which is cool and i'll have work in the show this weekend and then i'll have work in uh, a three-person show in september september 7th i think he just announced that on instagram even uh it's me and two other wonderful artists uh from different places in the country i don't remember exactly where but um so that would be cool those are a huge focus right now is that's awesome. It's, it's gallery work and putting together yeah. right now. I'm figuring out, you know, what I want to show and how I want to show it. Cause I haven't been doing a lot of gallery work or a lot of, uh, gallery shows. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for that? Because I work with Casey. Um, yeah. is it just like re-strategizing or? Yeah. I like, I'm just the kind of person that likes to stick with like one person or like one thing or, or, uh, yeah. Like the art world's crazy. Like, and it's so hard to navigate. It's so hard. Like you get hit up by galleries all the time and you wonder like you want to think it's all going to be these great experiences. And most of the time it turns out like it's not because not every gallery has their shit together. You don't know like how dedicated they are, how honest of people they are, how upfront they're going to be. You know, it can be really hard to work with galleries and shit. And so it was just once I met Casey, I mean, we're really different. We're almost we're almost like opposites in a lot of ways our personalities are you know mm -hmm. um but that seems to work in a way where it's like he gets that art world that i don't like and not interested in understanding or getting he gets that he works well in it and so he's like my point of contact with it and it just became like yeah i'll just trust him and believe in him and take his advice and his word and i'll let him guide that side of my career mm. because trying to do that as well as commercial work because i do a lot of commercial work as well you know just seemed like too much so i was like nah i'll just kind of give up the reins a little bit on that on the the whole fine art side yeah. and gallery showing and just take his word which it's it feels like it's paying off now because you know for a while he didn't have a gallery um he was still selling my work and stuff like that but mm -hmm. now that he's opening a gallery here in los angeles i see some some cool sh opportunities yeah that's uh, awesome. happening um but yeah you know just stuck with them yeah, I think it's good to understand where your weaknesses are and try to find people that can help you overcome those. Yeah. You know, or absolutely. just take care of it completely. Exactly. That's what I was just going to say, where it's like the stuff that he handles for me, I have no interest in ever doing. When you get to that point with working with somebody like in the kind of relationship that me and him have, and now yeah. we're really integrated and uh, you want to be able to just trust people because they're good people or whatever. But when they have incentive to be trusted, do you know what I mean? Like, um, I trust him because if he fucks me over, he fucks himself over. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like mutually assured destruction yeah. type thing. Like it wouldn't be in his interest to screw with me. Yeah. Right. If I sure. make money, if I'm doing well, he does well. So there's that incentive for everybody to do well then. So, yeah, I, um, I definitely trust him. Yeah. It, yeah. It's important to trust, but I mean, I think that you can also set up a working relationship in such a way where, you know, it would be against their interest to do something against your interests, where yeah, you just have to sure. align your interests together. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's that's what it, definitely about that for me. Yeah, and, I see that. Them, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, all that is going well. So, what what's going on with your art practice? I was just think I was I've been thinking about that a lot actually. Because I'm redoing my website right now, and <laughs> are you still taking a lot of photos? 
Well, that's that's where I was going to go with that. I mean, I when I started No Wave with Justin, my focus kind of got reverted on to being more of like the, I mean, my title is creative producer. And so now that I've had a couple years, you know, we're, we're about to hit our three year mark coming up. I'm just like, I was talking to him the other day and I was like, you know what? I think I want to, I mean, aside from like the painting and stuff, but I'm like, you know what? I really think I want to start photographing again. Sweet. Um, and working on projects like that. And, you know, I, cause I think like I got so focused on, Oh, let, let's make a successful business. Like, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, we're still trying to figure that out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think I'm like split down the middle to where I feel like I'm 50% a business person and 50% an artist, mm-hmm. you know, which is why I think I can really relate with other artists, but <laughs> then the other 50%, I mean, I went to business school. Oh, did you really? Yeah. I didn't, I don't think I knew that. Yeah. I have a business, business marketing degree. Really? Yeah. Okay. So like, anyways, to go back on, back in on that, you know, it's like, I realized that I've let certain parts of my artistic process that I used to use before, such as photography kind of lay, lay aside, but now I'm ready to reinvigorate it. You maybe that that rest probably helped, right? Like yeah. taking that the, a break from it, you probably come back with a renewed vigor or a different perspective. Yeah, I mean we've talked about this in uh, the podcast before, but I work in a lot of different mediums, but I do that so I stay fresh in each one. So yeah. I'll do painting. You know, it's always weird to say painting because I paint in a very non traditional like i'm not sitting there with a brush painting on canvas you know i'm like finger painting on plastic and shit but i call it painting but it is painting yeah i paint but then i'll put it away and i won't paint for like months you know yeah and then i'll draw for a long time but then like i haven't drawn now in a while but i'll probably go back to it soon and then i'll collage but uh taking those breaks every time then i come back to the medium it's changed a little bit like my approach to it is a little bit different or I see things a little bit differently or or even just like my taste in it has changed. So I'm like gunning for a different vibe than I used to be. And it's all because of those breaks. If you never take a break, you don't get that distance. You don't get that perspective. You don't get the overview effect, as they call it. So, yeah. So, I mean, you took a year break from photography? I would say that I haven't. I mean, yeah, I'll get hired for photo shoots here and there, but... I think mentally I've been out of photography for at least a year. Yeah. So maybe you'll come back, just like explode on the scene with that, you know, maybe you just have a new perspective. Who knows? But speaking of photography, that's been a huge part of my, um, my recent evolution is like getting a really good camera on. And now I'm taking all of my own collage material yeah yeah i'm taking yeah. all my own photographs that's which is awesome. which is new you know I've, I've taken my own photographs here and there as you know over the years um but some of the bigger stuff that i was doing i was working with photographers you know where we would work together i've talked about that on the podcast i think where i work with a photographer we do like some creative direction together yeah. they shoot photos given yeah. to me and i do the thing you yeah. were one of the uh, photographers i work yeah. with but now doing that all myself it's a whole different it adds like a whole different element to the, like, I mean, I'm seeing even the way that I relate to the images and like my process has completely changed. And like, I think even the goals are like the, the, not the goals, but, but just like what I feel comfortable doing. They don't feel the same needs that I did before because I, I felt when I was working with other photographers and they would give me the materials, there was this need to transform that material into something completely different. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to make it, mine i had to make this put my mark on it to like a degree that was like kind of over the top so that it was mine but now i don't have to like it's mine just from the beginning and i had such a hard time working with my own photos for a while and that's why i didn't do it because i would treat them as precious or i would analyze them be like oh these photos suck all these photos suck like shit but when somebody else would give me their shit it was just whatever it is, it just is like, I didn't have any control over it, you know? Um, well, I guess it goes back to almost that forgiveness thing we were talking about where it's easier to forgive somebody else, but it's hard. 
So I would have, it is, it is a form of forgiveness even when I would look at the photos and be like, oh, this is wrong with it. This is wrong with it. This is wrong with it. Because I took it. I see all those things. Yeah. Um, I couldn't forgive those things, but uh, yeah. those things wouldn't even be noticed when they're other people. So I got over all that and, and now it's become really exciting mm-hmm. and I'm really excited to see where it goes. And I'm working with color now too because of that in the degree. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting path to go down. So it, it's definitely opened me up to like a whole new, whole new thing. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how that unfolds for you. You know. Yeah, I mean, if hopefully things go how I want them to or how I have them in mind. But like the three person show in September, I should be uh, should be premiering or debuting some some work that's not. It's me for sure, you know, and like compositionally will be me and subject matter ish will be me and and all that. But hopefully there's some new materials in the mix and some new processes and shit like that. Yeah. Um, because of these new things that I'm working on or like these new materials and new um, mediums and whatever else. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah, man, it's it's exciting and terrifying. <laughs> yeah terrifying but i feel like i feel like you 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 kind of like it too you're welcoming it oh yeah totally yeah yeah which part do you mean actually though like do you mean like welcoming that the change or or welcoming that that being scared or being the the terrifying nature of it a little bit of both Yeah. yeah i think uh not knowing and knowing that you don't know and then going into something where you're approaching it with a different perspective there's something freeing with that terror in Mm -hmm. a way. It's kind of like these paintings and stuff that I've been doing. Like, I don't know the fuck I'm doing. Like literally, like technically and literally, I'm just like, I don't know what the fuck is, is I'm really doing, but there's something really, it's almost like meditating in a way. And maybe I'm like comparing it in a little weird way, but I don't know. There's something freeing about it too. I don't have any expectation about it. I'm just yeah. like, and and I don't really care if people see it because I'm just like, I almost disassociate myself with it. I'm like, oh, well, they suck. So whatever. <laughs> you know? There is something freeing in There's that. There's something freeing. I, yeah. It's almost like I didn't even do it. Yeah. You know? I was, um, yeah. I was talking to Riz, Riz and Matt, um, Vows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't remember what we were talking about, but it was a thought that I had earlier that same day that I was talking to him. And it was that uh, the beginning of every process or the first step of every process for me is overcoming fear. Like every pro like that's the first move mm-hmm. is that I over, you have to overcome the fear that you have about it because for some reason there's fear. Like uh, it's a very common thing where people say, you know, uh, there's like an, or an artist or painters will say like there's nothing scarier than a blank canvas or something like that right there's nothing Mm. more intimidating than a blank canvas Mm. or whatever right um yeah so i remember when i was in school uh you know teachers always give you stupid little fucking hacks for for things or whatever yeah but they're just like (laughs) oh just put put a random pencil mark on it so it's not a blank canvas anymore you know and like then you you know you're breaking that fear or whatever um but that's how I feel about like every all everything is that before you start, it's scary because well, for whatever reason, it's scary. But for me, there's it definitely starts like a fear. Like even I'm like fearful of my own photographs. Like now that's a newer that's a new one now that mm. I take all these photos. Yeah. Um like I almost I like I'll find myself procrastinating or putting off like, oh, you gotta go through those photos. And even though that's such a fun thing that you get to look at these photos and choose which ones to print off and turn into collages or whatever. There's still this fear of like, I don't know what that is, but mm-hmm. there's a fear associated with that, that I have to get over every time. Uh, mm. Same with like when I start collaging, like the, those first cuts are like not knowing what you're doing. Like it's scary not knowing what you're doing, but that's also like the best place for me to start. We talked about that in this podcast but there's a fear yeah. in it still that you yeah. have that I have to overcome every time. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking every day. I have to overcome a fear to be able to to work. Mm-hmm. And that's the interesting thing about boxing and martial arts too is because I mean, if you're sparring people or, you know, yeah, you know, let's just use that example of sparring people. You're putting yourself in that fear. It's not 
exactly um, an easy task to like, like even like the physical a physical fear, right? Where yeah. like you're going to get hit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it, that, that, that's the thing about I like about fighting is that it's so visceral. Mm-hmm. It immediately transports you to that feeling mm-hmm. that is relatable to many things, and you can apply that to all sorts of aspects of life. Yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're moving your body and using your body a lot, yeah. like if you, once it starts to get to that point where it's like you're sweating and stuff, I mean, it would be hard to think about other shit. You're, you're in your body at that point, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. it's super healthy that way. That's, yeah. And you're focused. Yeah. That's what got me on the running. It's just like that total mental collapse that happens where it's like, all you can think about is how much it sucks that you're running. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, that sounds ridiculous. Yeah. Like, because... I love I love it. I used to hate it. I well, I didn't even do it, but I would say that I hated it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, a big part of running is is hating running and then running through it. Yeah. <laughs> like that's like my favorite part of yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. But I guess maybe that's part of like the the fear thing too, where it's like um, you fear something until you just do it. You just make yourself do it. Yeah. Just kind of like the boxing thing where you just you got to step in. You got to step in and do it. Um, yeah even though you're scared of it Mm -hmm. running for me is like shortly after i start i'm like this sucks like this this is terrible Mm -hmm. but then you just make yourself do it anyways and then that's what the best feeling is at the end it's like yeah i can make myself do something i can make myself do anything well i yeah i think like the the scary and challenging things in life like that's kind of like the, you know, the idea of having these, these choices and making deliberate decisions. You know, it's like life will present you things that you can be afraid of or things that are challenging, but then it's like, how do you, how do you approach that? You know, like, do you lean into it and say, oh yeah, I don't want to get beat up, but, and I know that I'm probably going to get beat up for this next six months or do you stray, stray away from it. And I think that you can learn a lot from leaning into. Well, yeah, that's things. the whole idea of, um, I mean, it's avoidance versus, you know, just approaching something head on. Yeah. Like either you avoid something and try to go around it or you can go through it. But like, you know, it's commonly taught and said or whatever, but like the only way, what is it? Basically that you have to go through your fears and your issues or whatever. Like, cause you're, if you're constantly avoiding it, you never solve anything or you never, yeah. There's so much in my life where I didn't realize that was avoidance. That is avoidance. And at some point you realize like you just you have to just tackle those things head on. Otherwise, they just you're constantly going to be stepping around shit. There's always yeah. going to be something in your way and you're constantly going to have to walk around this thing. You're going to constantly have to go around a thing. So to deal with things, you have to just go through them. I think of them. I think of things like that as like a bubble or a cloud or whatever. But if there's a bubble, you can go around it. So the bubble's never broken. But if you just walk through it, it pops and then it, it fades away behind you and it's gone. That's how I think about issues or obstacles that I face that normally I would, you know, try to step around, be it like psychological issues, issues with my from my past or traumas and shit like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, more recently in life, just realizing like instead of just avoiding it and thinking that you're justified in avoiding these things, yeah. you just have to like focus on it, like just like data and focus on it and go through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because otherwise it's just going to haunt you forever. It's like kind of the same thing. Yeah, right? I agree. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, thanks for, um, yeah, thanks for doing yeah, this. Yeah, this was like the most casual one we've had, I think, the most casual podcast. This was like, it's this good. One. I thought, I think this was a great conversation. Right. Yeah, cool. man. Yeah. Excellent. I'm happy to have been here. Yeah. Cheers. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. Editing intern is Kelly Kekich. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you next time.